All right, welcome to the Edlow Podcast. Again, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I have here with me Ari Lehman. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. No, thank you, Josh. Wow, yeah. I really appreciate it very much. Yeah, well, you I'm have led here, man. You have led a very interesting life. And yeah, been... so far it's been very, very exciting, <laughs> you know, up to this point. You yeah. know, I think it will continue to be even more exciting. I mean, even just this week on our past tour, first Jason came up with a whole new format where oh, yeah? we, we do a concert and we do a Q&A and we screen Friday the 13th. But while we show the movie, uh, the band and I make a bunch of jokes and do comedy commentary and talk about all the funny stories from me being on the set. And just, you know, have a lot of fun with everybody. So well, that's it's awesome. amazing. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's, I'm curious. It's interesting because just reading a, a little bit about you, uh, you kind of, it seems as though you kind of uh, fell into getting the part. But, but before we get into that, let's just talk about, I mean, as you're growing up, are you a big horror fan? Well, I was interested in in horror i remember in summer camp mm -hmm. um when i would kind of compare notes with my friends like who is the best dracula mm -hmm. and i thought it was bella lugosi mm -hmm. okay but mm -hmm. my friend said no christopher lee and i was mm -hmm. like what christopher lee who's that i didn't even know who that was you know so you know it, it was always kind of a fun thing um, I remember seeing uh, Boris Karloff in The Mummy on television mm. when I was a little kid, and I was just completely mesmerized by that. You know, it takes place in, in, in Egypt, and it's a story of ancient Egypt, and then they actually film part of it at the Cairo Museum. It's a very, it's just a fascinating thing. So, you know, I think that horror really encompasses so much uh, mm -hmm. of the human experience. Um, but that said, do I watch horror, you know, every day? I'm kind of more of a guy who watches like documentaries mm. and studies different topics and uh, learns about different topics. Some of those topics can verge on the paranormal, of <laughs> course, you know. Okay. Um, and, and, and I love learning... Um, you know, we went to uh, when first Jason was touring recently, we got to visit the Edgar Allan Poe house. Oh, that's awesome. And and I'm a huge, huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I certainly I certainly am, am interested in that metaphysical aspect that mm -hmm. horror um, is unafraid to approach. Whether yeah. that's you know the 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 barrier between life and death, or you know just the demons that we all have within ourselves, and you know I think some of it is is symbolic, and mm -hmm. some of it is uh, very real, yeah. um, in my own experiences, um, but most importantly, I get to meet. These amazing people who, um, I mean, Josh, it's been 40 gazillion years since <laughs> I, I played this this little boy over here. Okay. Right. Um, Friday the 13th was shot in 1979. Right. And the fact that people, I mean, I'm very gratified that people still love this film. And that I had the honor to be in so long ago. And, you know, I hasten to add that if you were to divide my moments of screen time, you know, very brief, <laughs> right. effective screen time, that, that, that if you were to divide that by the number of people that I have scared <laughs> in the past 40 gazillion years, I think that I have a world record for the most people scared in the shortest screen time. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, I want when you were filming, I mean, you I got to imagine at the time, you had no idea that this was going to be such a huge franchise in horror. 
Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It was, in fact, there's there's one of the best stories, and it t- it tells us so much about the movie business, mm-hmm. which has its own set of horrors. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. And certainly, Sean Cunningham braved a lot of 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 horrors. He's the director of Friday the Thirteenth. Now, mm-hmm. Sean initially set out to make an entirely different movie, Josh. Mm-hmm. The movie I auditioned for as a little boy at the YMCA in Westport, <laughs> Connecticut. Mm-hmm. I was there because, you know, I was a little actor who could sing, et cetera, et cetera. But also, I could play soccer. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Sean, yeah. Sean was making a movie about a ragtag bunch of orphans who win their orphanage back from the mob in a soccer tournament. <laughs> yeah, that that was the movie. And it was a, a heartwarming tale, you know, and 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 not only that, they filmed part of that movie in Cosmo Stadium. They had some of the New York Cosmos were in it. I think even Pele was in this movie um, <laughs> it, during a flashback sequence. But Paramount Pictures said, wow, great movie. It was like the Sandlot of soccer, okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But nobody played soccer in 1978 in the United right. States. <laughs> right. Like, nobody. Maybe if we lived in Connecticut, and, you know, Connecticut, it was cool in Connecticut, you know. Uh-huh. But there were no soccer moms. You know, it's a great idea 15 years too soon, maybe. So classically, they said, look, Sean, we're not going to cut out on you. You're a great director. In fact, you did this wonderful film called Last House on the Left. Mm. Mm -hmm. So why Mm -hmm. don't you give us another horror offering? In the rest of the time you have and with the rest of the money you have. In other words, he had no time and, and, and no money. Mm. He had spent he had spent full budget making this great soccer movie. So the next thing I know, I'm being called uh <laughs> Ari. Ari, Ari, we need you to get back. We need you to come. We because it you'll see it, it gets better. It's like <laughs> The first time they said, Ari, okay. I picked up the phone. It was the summer after the soccer movie. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So it's Sean Cunningham. And he says, Oh, good. I got you on the phone. Ari, we need you to get down here right away. We're doing another movie and we need you to get right, just get here. And I said, Sure, Sean. And he goes, Wait, can you swim? And I said, yeah, I can swim. And he said, great, get down here. You got the part. That's it. Just get here, you know? And, um, yeah. So, famously, when I got to the studio, Sean wasn't there, and they handed me Kevin Bacon's script. (laughs) And it says, the counselor and his girlfriend are in the bunk in the cabin. And I was like, wow. (laughs) I was all 14 years old, and I was thinking like this. Sean came over, he said, he must have seen the look on my face. So he said, he said, oh, Ari, that's Kevin's script. Oh, so, so, but then he told me, you're going to be the monster. So, you know, as a 14 year old, that was pretty freaking cool. And I got to work with Tom Savini and, you know, the entire experience of, creating the the makeup and and learning all about horror was absolutely transformational for me mm-hmm. um what i learned on the set of friday the 13th mm-hmm. that that i really utilize to this day is make use of what you have in front of you mm. um Sometimes when we have a limitation of themology, it can increase our creativity. Ah, yeah. So I watched as Tom Savini and Sean Cunningham and Barry Abrams, you know, they 
they created this low budget film very quickly, like mm -hmm. right in front of our eyes. And a lot of those different ideas for the kill scenes and everything were, were basically, they came up with a lot of that, especially the special effects right mm -hmm. on the spot. Hmm. So, um, yeah. And, and, and Tom and his partner, Tasso Stavrakis, they were a lot of fun to hang out with. It was like the teach and chong of horror, you know, <laughs> and they would make me laugh all the time and we would have so much fun, but they were super creative, you know, mm -hmm. always pushing the edge of creativity. And um, so the only scene that I was to do originally, not in the final mm -hmm. take, but in the originally was just, the drowning child, Jason, he's drowning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and now, you know, it, it's kind of funny, but when I was a little boy, the movie Jaws came out. Mm -hmm. So I lived near the, the beach in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, my parents liked to sit and eat their picnic lunch and I would go <laughs> swimming. Right. And so, of course, I figured out that they were scared that the sharks would eat me. <laughs> so, I, one day, <laughs> I pretended to drown just like this. <laughs> that. And, um, yeah, I think I may have scared my father. He came over to me and said, oh, oh, I was like, yes. But then, of course, I laughed and laughed. And then he was he was rather upset, but I guess he was relieved. But then I proceeded to do that every day because we lived right next to the beach. So we would go to the beach and they would set up their picnic lunch and then I would pretend to be drowning. And then, <laughs> so, you know, my dad was like, okay, let this junk eat you, you know, whatever. But by the time I got to the set of Friday the 13th, I had it perfected, you know. Right, right. You're like, oh, I'm going to get the Oscar for drowning scenes. <laughs> <laughs> they should make this category. What? Yeah, right. But they have that. <laughs> Man. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, so there I was. I went home in the summer of 1979 thinking I played a drowning child. Well, <laughs> that's it. You know, there goes my movie career, as it were. And, um, but lo and behold, Paramount Pictures once again mm -hmm. said we're, they said again we're not going to buy this movie because a you have a, 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 an old lady gets her head chopped off and then a little boy b drowns mm -hmm. and then we need something we need some kind of some ending so mm -hmm. they said can you come up with something and so basically they had based the whole Friday the 13th on Halloween. Mm -hmm. So writer Victor Millers had seen Carrie. Ah. So he said, oh, that ending sequence of Carrie where the arm comes out. He said, let's throw that in there. And Tom Savini designed the final sequence. Mm. So I came back in October of 1979. They called me back to the set again to film that final sequence. Mm -hmm. Well, when Paramount saw it with that sequence, they loved it so much that they 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 distributed it in 800 theaters across the country on the same day. That had never been done before. That was a unprecedented thing. So, wow. in as much as the impact of the scene had a great effect on the popularity, so did the the way it was distributed. The way that Friday the 13th was distributed had a lot to do, I think, with its ultimate success. Wow. Now, when you're so so you understand that this is like while you're filming it, that it was going to be a kind of a low budget, quick you know, movie put together. Did you think it was going to flop or did you were you like, what did you think? Well, I didn't being little yeah. little Ari Lee and I thought this is it, man. You know, I'm going <laughs> to the top here. But. Sean Cunningham did, in fact, sell the rights to Friday the 13th to director Steve Miner, 
prior mm. to the release of the initial film. Oh. Which is something he doesn't like to talk a lot about. Right. But he did get back in. Uh, 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 part four is really largely a Sean Cunningham creation. But um, yeah, initially he, like you said, he, he, he was very unsure of the way that the audience would take that final scene because mm. he didn't want it to have any kind of a paranormal or weird, like, um, right. monster movie thing. He just wanted it to be like a reverse psycho. Right. In other words, the mother in is hearing the voice of the child from beyond the grave, as opposed to psycho where it's the child hearing the mother from beyond the grave. Right. But right. once I come out of the water and grab Alice, there goes that theory. Right. And many fans, I don't know if, if you're hip mm -hmm. to that whole Friday the 13th mythos, but it doesn't really have a definitive story because was Jason real? Was mm -hmm. he just a dream? You know, right. I right. think fans have accepted that Jason is real. Right. Well, now there's been a thousand of them. So, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> he better be pretty real, I would assume, at this point. Well, well, he's more real than Freddy, who's who's a dream. Right, right. And, yes, right. 15 actors have played Jason. Yeah. Um, uh, But I'm very proud to have been the first. Yes. Now, now when you um, – so I'm assuming you do a lot of, like, horror cons, comic cons, things like that. When you do that uh, – do you ever get a chance to discuss this with like, has there ever been like a panel of Jason's that are all sitting there talking about their experiences playing it or oh, have you yes. had an opportunity oh, to yes. talk to them? How's oh, that yes. go? If we've had, we've had many um, panels of Jason's, but the most fun were the ones when Steve Dash, who played Sackhead Jason mm -hmm. and Kane Hodder were there and they would just insult each other comically they would riff and make, I'm sorry, but they would make horribly disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> they would say really gross things and make everybody laugh. Um, yes. Well, recently I did a panel like that um, with Kane and mm -hmm. with Douglas Tate, who was in um, uh, Freddy versus Jason mm -hmm. um, at the very end. And then I've done a number of panels um, with all of the Jasons. Um, but perhaps most fun for me, Josh, was when I got to work with Betsy Palmer, who played mm. Pamela Voorhees. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so Betsy um, was an amazing person. And mm. she had an amazing career. She was, it was like, you're talking to somebody from the golden era of Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, I remember being in Hollywood with her and we were with a group of people and we walked over those stars, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, Betsy doesn't happen to have a star. And I was saying, Oh, please, nobody say anything. Just, just keep going. And someone said, why didn't they give you a star? You know? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I said, Oh dear. You know, she said, yes. don't worry, Ari, look at where the stars are. People just walk over them all day long and throw their gum and spit. <laughs> and then she said, look, the Academy. And she pointed to the these huge statues just glaring down. <laughs> you know, she said, fuck Hollywood. <laughs> she told me many times, fuck Hollywood. I like to do dinner theater. People bring me flowers. I get dinner. I'm not waiting around on... To, to, huh. to wait for the phone to ring to play somebody's mother. Right. And up until her 80s, she was doing theater. She could memorize entire uh, scripts. She probably had 30 or 40 scripts memorized. People don't realize she played G. She, she was in like GG on Broadway. Mm. She was in uh, Mr. Roberts with mm. Henry Fonda and Jack Lemon. And wow. she plays this brassy, you know, she's the head of the the, the waves, the, the female sailors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she she just 
inspired me so much, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I got to do panels with her, <laughs> but <laughs> she was so cool. And, and I would come out, okay, I would come out you know, with my my metal gear on, looking like Mr. Metal Guy. Right. She would wear an old lady sweater. <laughs> and then she'd just start making penis jokes. <laughs> and she would just, what's the matter, Ari? And I would turn bright red and she was like, dude, you know, she, she lived with James Dean for two years. I mean, two months, two months, two months. That's wow. Two, two months. And they were very close. And yeah, no, I mean, you know, they were lovers. And she was wow. uh, she was just somebody who taught me a lot. And, and she said that I should make the most of what I have to work with and find different ways to, to express myself artistically. Like, she really championed my metal band. Mm. Mm -hmm. If she knew I, because very often I'd be doing a convention, but then we'd go off somewhere else to do a show, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and she would always say, knock them dead and leave them writhing in the aisles. <laughs> that, was, that was her, that was her thing. She would always encourage me. So at the shows, I would bring her, like she was vegetarian. I'm vegetarian. So mm. everybody would go to eat steak. Mm -hmm. or something and we would go eat chinese food or italian food and split a bottle of wine and <clears throat> she would have parties at these conventions back in the day you know which were i don't know they were they were really a lot more fun back then especially because <laughs> of her but <laughs> it would go crazy and she would say to me ari pass the joint it's not a microphone <laughs> So, so you're interesting. You're vegetarian. Is that a is that a moral thing or a health thing or both? Huh. Well, I made the decision to become a vegetarian when I was a little kid, largely because I wanted to lose weight. Mm. And my first way of doing that was by eliminating desserts. Mm. Mm -hmm. But then I really missed desserts. <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of mine said, well, you could just become vegetarian. And, and, and that's how it actually started. But then it being, you know, the seventies. Right. So there was many people encouraging me to be a vegetarian from a, mm -hmm. from a spiritual perspective. And mm -hmm. I did, um, by great fortune, I had a teacher who uh, was a jazz piano teacher, but she also worked together with the famous Mahavishnu Orchestra mm. from the 70s, which was a very spiritually motivated rock band who were all devotees of Sri Chinmoy, the Hindu uh, teacher, the, uh -huh. the guru. And um, so, yeah, when she found out I was vegetarian, she was very encouraging of that. And, um, you know, as time passed, I guess I, I, I read a lot of books and stuff. There's a great book by T.H. White, in fact. It's called The Book of Merlin, hmm. which is the final chapter of Once and Future King, the story of the education of King Arthur. But in the final chapter, it's, it's the great battle between King Arthur and 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 the the son of Morgan Le Fay, who is his illegitimate son, and they're gonna it's it's supposed to be the final battle of everything. But secretly their fate is being decided in this book mm -hmm. by the animals. Hmm. Should man be allowed to survive is the question. And the horses get up and they say, well, they're always riding on us and making us carry stuff and this and that, you know. And then the pigs get up and say, oh, they just kill us for food. And the chickens say the same thing. But then finally, the dogs get up. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, 
mankind is not so bad because sometimes they'll do anything for us and they show us unconditional love and 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 even though we we don't always behave but they they still love us and 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 so the dogs make this impassioned speech and save mankind <laughs> and uh i have to admit that that book uh made me want to not eat animals and so how long has it been now oh my gosh i was vegetarian on the set of friday the 13th wow so it's been over 40 years man yeah gosh. wow but back and, and, then to me being vegetarian was uh you know eating macaroni and cheese i mean there was a lot of cheese cheese going on right cheese sandwiches <laughs> oh, i love cheese. and you can imagine when i went on tour at the mm -hmm. beginning, you know, um, trying to find vegetarian food way back in the 80s in a, from a tour bus was yeah. hard. But flash forward to now. <laughs> Forget it. Everybody <laughs> has vegan everything. Yeah. Two things happened, Josh, to, in my life that we never would have imagined back then. And one was widespread availability of vegetarian food, even vegan food. I don't even, I eat no dairy now for a long time. Mm. Um, but also the legalization of marijuana. <laughs> I, you know, that's funny. It's so, it's so wild. You know, I, I was telling my, uh, my, I have a son who's 17. He's a guitar player and he sings, uh, you know, he sings in a choir and stuff like that. He's, he's been in a number of honor choirs. He's doing very well. But I was telling him, I was like, you don't understand that what you guys are living right now. When I was your age, I could have never imagined life being like this. Marijuana is legal. <laughs> like gender isn't even a thing anymore. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it, to, the, to think that that you know, marriage, you know, same gender marriage is legal. Marijuana is legal in some areas psychedelics are legal well, yeah i mean, I mean it's... just for us just on the sheer operative level of touring you know mm -hmm. and constantly i mean i okay when i got out of college um i started working with world music mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i was in a band from nigeria west africa for like 10 years right and you were playing you piano for them right I, I, yes. I mean, I'll tell, I'll tell you about that, but just, you can imagine what it was like right. crossing the country back then with a band from West Africa and we all tr were trying to find we. <laughs> 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 and so of course only I could go out and try to find we, Oh, like the time Prince helped me find weed in Minneapolis. Yes. <laughs> sending me into the ghetto in the middle of the night and i didn't care i said fine i'll go in there yeah. the like if prince me. is telling me to go it must be okay well they gave me the code and see i was from brooklyn so i thought you know whatever mm -hmm. man right i'm walking through and i got into the middle of i said man this is so i got in there and i said victor sent me yeah. And wow, did they laugh. They said, yeah, we've been waiting for you, man. <laughs> but they also said, you know, guns work the same in Minneapolis as they do in Brooklyn, bro. <laughs> Somehow man. I got back to the hotel. Yeah. You but know, it was what kind I find... of things, Josh, we, we don't have to do now. Yeah. So, th ah, we were right. just, every border we were, oh, just forget it. These things are gone and we can focus on what we should always focus on mm -hmm. the music yeah. first and foremost secondly or not secondly but equally you know the fans interacting yeah. with the fans um meeting the fans mm -hmm. and now here's another thing when you think about it we never would have thought that uh, the way that doing the selfie with the fan you know signing the autograph for the fan that has become such an integral part of the experience of seeing a a, a rock show now and yeah. also of course you know the convention 
yeah. experience, you know. Have well, you gone they, to a horror convention? I haven't been to any horror conventions. I actually went to my first, my daughter, my daughter's a big anime fan, and I'm here in Sacramento, and they had a SAC anime. Oh, sure. And, well, no, and that's so, similar. Sure, yeah, so anime. we walked we we walked through there, and man, it was it was it was crazy. It was like some sort of psychedelic uh, uh, Disneyland. Everybody's well, dressed their cosplayers up. Cosplayers are the best. They oh, the they best were amazing. Cosplayers. Yeah, they and, were amazing. Um, the 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 voiceover actors in anime are extremely popular, and yeah, it's it's just this whole other component of the thing. Like back then, we were almost taught to be like aloof. And mm -hmm. like not interact, you know, somehow. Sure. But I mean, now, for instance, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, there's a very great horror band called Ice Nine Kills. Oh, yeah. They were, they okay. came to Sacramento for Aftershock. <laughs> yeah. Well, first Jason was really greatly benefited because the singer, Spencer Charnas, asked me to sing on one of his songs mm -hmm. and then he came and sang on one of our songs nice. but the reason i'm bringing up spencer and einstein kills is because wow if you look at the level i mean they have brought fan interaction it's like an art form it's like it's mm -hmm. they they because they you know they have like two clothing companies they mm -hmm. they they have uh, psychos only i mean certainly first jason has benefited from from this kind of thing and and like our new friday the 13th fun night thing that's what it's all about and i'm mm -hmm. taking a page from from their book but i just i just just to express how different it is you yeah. know nowadays like look at us you know now fan can listen to me talking about all these right. you know things that they never would have never would have heard back back in the yeah day. and that's what's that's what's so cool about i think just the the way technology has changed here i mean you would be doing radio interviews all the time and here you are doing podcasts with people who are legit fans i mean that's cool you know no, what you're I mean? right you're right yeah. the radio interview thing it, it's it's very strange it's yeah. it's different you know because sometimes, I mean, I can remember them being, you know, they call you up. All right, we're gonna, you're gonna be on with Marty in the morning, and just, they gotta call you at six a.m. All right, and you're yeah, like, fine. And you, and you be sitting there in the hotel room. Hey, it's Marty in the morning. You're like, hey, everybody, it's the Jason Voorhees. You know, yeah. like, trying to wake up, and you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so music now, you, it's interesting because you, you're now, you know. Uh, First Jason is a horror metal band. You started in like a Nigerian world music band. Tell me, what did you always have a metal background? Where who were your influences when you were learning how to, you know? Well, no, thank you. Yeah, I came up out of out of jazz. Hmm. I was actually playing jazz, like you mentioned. Your son, yeah, uh, is 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 looking at jazz, and yeah, I um um met this great teacher who taught me about jazz and so i ended up at new york university um mm. i was offered a, a a scholarship to go to berkeley mm. um i chose to go to new york because i wanted to get into the professional side mm. and so while i was at nyu i could actually go downstairs and hear at that time this isn't true anymore at mm. that time i could hear some of the finest piano players in the world they would be playing literally in the bars and jazz clubs right downstairs from me wow uh, on university place because of new york university and it was all these bradley's the famous piano bar and i heard like hank jones and tommy flanagan and you know i i could go see uh, mccoy tyner and just all the great players so that was a good choice for me so mm -hmm. but what ended up happening was Upon uh, uh, graduation, I first worked with some, you know, different rock and R&B artists. But then, okay, one of my friends was a uh, a, a cab driver from Nigeria. And mm. he was also a musician and also um, a spiritual teacher. But one day he calls me up and he says, Adi, 
you have to get to the studio right now. And I'm like, what? He's like, don't ask questions. Just get over there. So I was hanging out with my friend Nelson, also from West Africa. So Nelson's like, I'll drive you. Come on, let's go. So we go over there. And upon arrival, we walk in. And the lead singer knew the guy that I was with. Nelson, they, they had gone to high school together. They hadn't seen each other in 10 years. Oh, my God. You know, uh, It was like a Nigerian celebration. They were so happy to see each other. So, so that was good. And then they start playing a song. And they point to me solo. And what they didn't realize, they, 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 it was in C minor. And I could solo in C minor like nobody's business. So I got up on the synthesizer and I started sitting. And boom, I had the job, you know. Yeah. And, um, it, was, it was an artist named Majek Fashek from hmm. Nigeria. So he was very, very big in West Africa. Came over here. I, I toured with him. I, I, the, the album that we did was produced by Little Steven, Steve Van Zandt. Wow. The guy from The Sopranos. That guy from, from wow. the Springsteen band. Yeah. So Majek was, was huge. We, we, got, we were touring. We played at the Apollo Theater. Wow. I got a standing ovation for my C minor solo. And nice. that, um, 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 you know, I was the only American guy in this West African band. And um we even got to be, you know, this guy uh Eddie Grant was well, gone through Electric Avenue. No, we blew him off the stage in LA, <laughs> man. It was thousands <laughs> of people there because all the Nigerians came to see Majek and Jimmy Iovine gave him a recording contract uh, for Interscope Records. Oh, yeah. And that was an amazing experience. Um, then basically what happened, brother, is that, well, history, you know, uh, the world music scene had a lot of ups and downs, but the big down was 9-11. Was mm. Because all of a sudden it wasn't like there was this international music scene of love and peace and everybody trying to get along. I mean, we were learning music of all kinds. I was learning Latin music, Arabic music, North African music, everything. You can't just... I worked in a place, it was a very hopeful time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I worked in a place called Multiculti, where we had music from all over the world. I mean, just people would come in there and you just really... I really believed in my bones that through music we could we could make such a such a change, you know. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that. In fact, mm -hmm. I think that's the only way we can really make a change. We have to be as dynamic and entertaining as all of these news cycles. <laughs> we have to be more dynamic and more distracting than, than AI, because mm -hmm. that's what artists have always done. Mm -hmm. So I watched, um, I watched that change. Sadly, I watched, I watched the second projectile hit the second tower from my apartment building roof wow. in New York City. You mean live, like live? You saw, I saw it, it with my bare eyes. I wow. after the first one was on fire, I went to the roof. I saw the second projectile hit. Wow! I saw the first building start to come down, and I said, "I'm getting the fuck out of it." Uh, no, but we stayed in New York. We stayed mm -hmm. in New York for some time, um, and so uh, through my beautiful wife Elaine. Uh, uh, managed to get us um, uh, in as Red Cross volunteers at Ground Zero. So I was I was there for many weeks at the at the Ground Zero site, which I wow. also saw with my own eyes. And it's wow. something that you can't unsee. But you know, um, what I did there was I made coffee for the mm. firemen and the policemen, and I knew that they wanted really strong hot coffee. Okay. <laughs> So I made really good coffee, and I was awarded four teddy bears 
which was a very high morale award. <laughs> okay. I was wow. one of the teddy bears at Ground Zero. But yeah, it was it was beyond belief. How how and, was uh, that how was that experience being at Ground Zero as there, you know, the for the weeks after? I mean, what what was it like? Was it somber? Was there kind of unity? I just remember the the weeks after 9-11, I felt like the country at least was kind of unified. And, well, yeah, uh, that was the spirit, Josh. It was, it, you know, it's like when we're doing triage, we got to get out there. It's not about what happened. It's about how can we help this person or how can we help that situation? And yeah. when we begin to focus uh, as human beings on each other, how can I help this fireman go down into that pit? Yeah. Where there was a freaking river of molten metal, bro. Yeah. And I remember that day, it was so cold and dark and rainy. And, and you just know that the only thing that we have left was hope. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that we had was, 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 was each other. Wow. And, and, and it would be easy to capitulate. And the last thing anybody needed at that moment was weak coffee. Let me tell you. <laughs> I literally poured out the urns of weak coffee and refilled them, cleaned them, and just got that coffee going, man. Because, you know, sometimes you just got to say, like, that's what artists are for, really. Mm -hmm. It's that reality is always going to have its ups and downs, you know. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and people work all freaking weak. And their bosses are yelling at them. Their family is pressuring them. Their internal monologue is, is devastating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're misleading themselves. Right. They need to be cognizant. You know, everybody talks about manifestation. They need to be cognizant that abundance is manifest. Mm -hmm. And it's just being cognizant of the abundance that's manifest all around you and you know that songs can do that yeah that songs can make you appreciate your family or your wife or life itself or just anything and mm -hmm. and if we take time that's what music is for that's what art is for now of course my songs tend to be a little different <laughs> <laughs> My songs tend to be about facing that inner peril and 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 having the courage to, you know, it, it it's music that shakes you up, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping that I'm shaking people up to look at themselves and see the strength in themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like if you look at some of the lyrics of First Jason, like my song "Sink or Swim." Mm -hmm. Which, which you know, that's what it's about. It says, "Look at, look at your life, and choose to, choose to not sink, choose to swim." You know, this, right? You know, so, um, uh, you know, how did, of course, it's how did in you... the metaphor of Jason. You know, so, yeah. so all my songs, you know, Jason never dies. Yeah, which is a positive message in it. You know, you <laughs> yeah, definitely, so, definitely an oxymoron. Did no. what, what? What made you go from the world music? Like, what got you into the metal part? Was well, it that's just... a great question. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I was, I had worked with Majek, and even after that, I worked with some Jamaican reggae bands, which was also great. Mm -hmm. And that took me on reggae Sunsplash tour, and I even, you know, I traveled to Africa. I got to open for Steel Pulse and all this stuff. It wow. was something else, man. But then, so I get back. World music is over after 9-11. But, you know, the internet is starting to bubble. Mm -hmm. So somebody mm -hmm. sends me an email. Did you autograph this photo? Mm -hmm. And it's a picture of little Jason. Mm. <laughs> and I I said no I've mm -hmm. never autographed any photos and the guy said but aren't you Ari Lehman the guy that played 
the little Jason in Friday the 13th. And I'm like, yeah, I am. And then it just, it all comes back to me. I'm like, do you mean that people charge $50 for my autograph? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just paid 50 bucks for this on eBay. Wow. And so we had to, we found the source who claimed mm -hmm. it was from a third party. And that mm -hmm. source was kind enough to return the money to this individual and others. And then to purchase autographs from me, knowing that mm -hmm. he had found. And, and I was like, well, this is something. <laughs> yeah. And um, so then Tony Timpone of Fangoria Magazine mm -hmm. invited me to a convention in New Jersey at the Meadowlands. Mm -hmm. And there was thousands of people there. And Betsy Palmer was there and Kane Otto was there. And oh my gosh. But I had my reggae music CDs. Mm. So I met some of the, you know, and they, I, like some people bought the CD, went home, came back, and they were like, they were metalheads. They were like, you know, I don't listen to reggae usually, but this is pretty good, Ari. You know, yeah. with the New York, hey, Ari, that's pretty good. But it dawned on me, hit them where they live, you know. Right. Don't got to, you know. So I thought about, first Jason mm. and and initially well I had a friend who was in a band called Reagan Youth and that was a punk band and he had taken me to CBGB's to see Bad Brains to see Dead Kennedys to see White Zombie so mm. you know I had some reference points although back then you know I was like the jazz hippie right right <laughs> and then uh, you know um, but now I was looking at this. So then another friend of mine who had worked for Chromags, which is a band, he had drummed with them. He jumped on board. Then I moved to Chicago and the bass player from a band called Macabre mm -hmm. also jumped on board. And those two guys helped me a lot. I found that the metal scene was very open-minded and gave, gave me a chance to find my voice. Hmm. And after a while, I had my first album, Jason is Watching. The unique thing about my band, of course, is that I play guitar, not guitar, not bass, but a keyboard like this. Hmm. So I play guitar through a heavy metal pedals. So it's like distortion, heavy metal guitar. So hmm. I'm known as the evil wizard of guitar. And, you know, that became, you know, all the work that I had done on piano, I translated it to guitar. So I do showstoppers like, you know, Bach, Takata, and Fugue in the middle of the set, you know. Wow. And, and that's what it's about. It's about guitar pyrotechnics. <laughs> and that's a big thing of First Jason now. Uh, I travel with a drummer and a bass player who sing and mm. play their asses off and are very great. And um, so we've gotten to open for Ice Nine Kills and we've gotten mm. to open for Twisted and we've gotten to open for Incantation and all these wonderful bands, Nuclear Assault, and Third Eye Blind and all this stuff. Um, but for the large part, we just play small rock clubs and at horror cons. And now we have this new thing, Josh, where... We also screen Friday the 13th. Yeah. So the band sits there and I do a commentary and they make jokes and everybody <laughs> drinks and it, you know, it's a fun time. We, we play trivia game and, uh, you know, question and answer. And so that becomes, you know, a whole new experience. One so, of the things that one of the things that's really cool is sound. This reminds me. So I'm a I, I do pro wrestling, right? And I do independent pro wrestling. And one of the things that's really cool about that versus say a WWE show is the access to the wrestlers. And this is very much sounding just like that. What you're doing is is you're giving not only are you playing your music, but then you're giving the people in the crowd an opportunity to kind of interact with you and meet you. It's just a completely. It's almost like a Comic Con experience where they come in and they get to say. I hung out with Ari Lehman and watched Friday the 13th with him. And he shared stories about yeah. being on set. 
I mean, yeah, they go nuts, man. They love it because every it's like we're all just hanging out, and the film is just short enough to mm -hmm. make it. You know, it 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 just works great. But yeah. I love wrestlers, man. I love wrestlers. I've met so many wonderful wrestlers. Uh -huh. One of the greatest people I ever met in my life is is the great Roddy Piper, man. I mean, I don't know. Oh, if, yeah. What Roddy an Piper amazing cool guy. person. Just what a great what a great person I could tell you stories about. Um also uh Diamond Dallas Page, you know, what yeah. a, just amazing people just just great performers, great athletes, but again, perhaps people who really broke that barrier of interaction. I mean, Diamond Dallas, you know, he's helping people with their health and everything. Yeah. Yeah. But Roddy was just such a sweet individual. Yeah. You know, he would always, you just always felt like he was on your side. Yeah. Such I, a good, I, he was a good guy. Anybody who met him, you know, generally uh, had a good experience with him. He really cared about people when he got to meet them, especially as he got older. Mick Foley, mankind. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's an amazing person. I mean, there's so many amazing wrestlers. Uh, um, I love that whole approach to life that they have. You know, it's, uh, yeah, they're, I'm not as tall as them, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I also dwell in that in that kind of mythical realm, you know, where yeah. sometimes people see you as a character in real life and, yeah. and wrestlers definitely <laughs> have, yeah. have the make on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I it was telling a friend of mine who doesn't understand it. I said, the one thing that's cool about, about wrestlers is if you meet Hulk Hogan, you're meeting Hulk Hogan, you meet Tom Cruise, you're not meeting Maverick. Right. So you know, true. you you meet Ari Lehman. May, maybe they feel like it, but they don't they don't they're not actually meeting Jason Voorhees. They're meeting the <laughs> actor. But, no, but it's well, you so meet funny because I just did an interview and um, they said, OK, introduce yourself. You know, just like you normally would. I said, hey, it's me, Ari Lehman, the first Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th. And they're like, no, just just like you normally do. And I'm like. That's how I normally act. Yeah. I'm very <laughs> and people love that because yeah, you know, I'm I'm being ironic about it. It's like, come on, just just have fun with it. Yeah. Well, that's cool. You know, some people, some be it's funny because some people that they had like this this thing that that happened to them that kind of changed the course of their life in that way. Sometimes they get a little annoyed by it, right? Like, oh, all you want to talk about is you know, Jason Voorhees, all you want to talk about is Friday the 13th. But the fact that you embrace it is so cool, right? Well, is that you, yeah. yeah. Well, you know who taught me that was Betsy, but also um, Sid Haig, who mm. played Captain Spaulding in mm. the Rob Zombie movies, The Clown. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and he gave me a great um, insight. He said, when the people come to talk to you, it's mm -hmm. not about you. Mm -hmm. You already did it. Mm -hmm. You jumped out of the lake. Yeah. Okay. Now they want to tell you because they couldn't tell you then. Right. Right. You know, so they come and, 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 you know, I think it's very important that the individual who has that honor, just, just don't be egotistical about it and just have fun with it and mm -hmm. let the person so I always say, oh, wh when did you see Friday the 13th? And then mm -hmm. they tell me a story about how they pissed their pants in front of their aunt. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it's great. Or they tell me, oh, my my seven-year-old kid loves Jason and plays Jason. Here's a picture of my seven-year-old playing Jason. You know, you know, just to be a part of that great tapestry, which really is 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 it's in the imagination of people. Mm, right. So perhaps the less that I like, like the more that I could just channel that imagination and then yeah. just reflect it, you know, and have fun yeah. with it. And just in the end, just come on. It, it's just, um, it's just fun. You know, it's, yeah. it's all about fun. I mean, I, 
we certainly sometimes we say, oh, especially when they're saying this about Jason and Michael and Leatherface, and they compare them as characters, and they say, oh, you know, that Michael, he, he, he has no cap. You know, he's got <laughs> no moral compass. Whereas, right. you know, Jason loves his mother, you know, and all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> and I love playing those characters, too. But, you know, in the end, let's just have fun with it. And, and, and uh, you know, some of the most touching things are kids, you know, sometimes kids who are on the spectrum who really relate to Jason. Mm. And, you know, their mom will come up and, and with them. And then I just totally feel like, if anything, that's the greatest honor for me. Mm. The fact that those kids, and they're so present emotionally, those mm. kids on the spectrum. And, mm -hmm. and um, I don't, I can't really express what I'm trying to say, but it's uh it's it's a great it's a great um great uh privilege to yeah. have well and let me ask you you know here's the thing you've, you've lived a very interesting life you've been, gotten to tour in all these different bands you got to be the first Jason Voorhees is there something about you that you feel like some characteristic that makes you like successful in these ways that other people could emulate oh gosh <laughs> well I think the best thing, the best answer to this qu mm -hmm. question um, would be for everyone to remember that you've been given a talent. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a talent. Everyone has talents in different avenues of life. But we have to remember that the talents that we've been given are not for us. The talents we've been given are to be shared. And then once you begin to share the talents, you build upon them because it's in that engagement and in that storytelling, whether we're doing it as an actor or a, or a, a, a splashy stunt man <laughs> or, or my favorite way is music mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's so immediate and the mm -hmm. communication, but just to share the talent and then immediately you begin to grow the talent mm -hmm. and to grow as a person. And, you know, just to be open. And um, I think also to remember that anybody that you encounter, there's a reason for their presence. Mm -hmm. There was a reason why some random person might be in front of you. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you a story. Once I was in a lobby of a hotel in, in, in Massachusetts somewhere, and, and, and we were signing autographs. This, this big guy had come in without telling anybody and started laying machetes on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I came down and I started signing. So we're laughing it up with the staff. And so there's a commotion going on and this you know there was a resident who must have lived in the hotel mm. and it was an old guy you know and he's in a bathrobe with a walker you know the kind of person that people just usually ignore just let him right. let the old man in the walker go by you know right, right. but i had that little feeling and he was all smiling because we were laughing so i said Hey, man, what are you doing? Something like that. And he's like, what are you doing over there? So he comes over with his thing. And he goes, he looks at the thing. And he goes, he realizes what's up. And he says, I was in Jaws. <laughs> and we go, what? He goes, yes, I was in the movie Jaws. And sure enough, he shows us on his phone. You know, he was an extra in the movie Jaws. <laughs> and not only that, he went on to be, a, he's like a football coach and he helped all these people in his life. And, 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 and he gave me all these insights and it was just fun to talk to that person. And that's just one 
tiny example of how that theory works. You know, mm -hmm. I think that for whatever reason, whoever's in front of you at that moment, that just do your best to engage. And always remember, we can't say the perfect thing. There's no perfect thing to say, but to mm -hmm. be present for another person is the perfect thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, listen, Ari, it's been a, a awesome for me to, I rem, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, my story, I was probably seven or eight years old and I was actually staying at my aunt's house and she, <laughs> uh, she was, she was a little bit of a rebel and unbeknownst to my parents allowed me to rent the VHS Friday. The I love it. And she, and so we watched it and I remember and by, by that time when I watched it, they'd already had a few of them. So I knew of the Jason that was, uh, you know, the, that had the, ski, the hockey mask and everything. And so I was expecting that and I didn't get it. Right. But then you jumped out of that, you know, and I didn't I didn't necessarily feel that the movie was particularly scary until you came out of the movie. <laughs> and then the whole movie was scary, <laughs> you know. And so, yeah, I have that. I, I have that. And it, when I just I'm grateful that I had an opportunity to talk to you and just hear your perspective, because I always love hearing people who've had just a cool life doing really cool things that you never would have expected. And, and your story is so typical of how life works. You walk in thinking you're just doing one little thing and you end up doing this amazing thing that changes the course of your life all because you took a shot and went to an audition. Yeah. Just, just show up, just show yeah. up for life. Yeah. Because that's, you take that first step, you'll know how to take the second one yeah. and then the universe responds. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, but thank you for saying that. That's a very kind and insightful thing to say. People yeah. don't always say those things on podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been it's been a pleasure. Let's do this again sometime. I'd Absolutely. Love to talk to you more. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. And yeah, send no me the link so I can share this with the fans. Absolutely will. Thank you. Thanks, we'll Josh. See Jason never dies. <laughs>